Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending Laurier's Milton, Laurier's Milton Lecture Series. This is the final lecture of our 2021-2022 season. If this is your first lecture of the series, welcome. If not, welcome back. My name is Maria Patrico, and I work for the Milton Public Library. We are so proud to be partners with the Wilfrid Laurier University on this incredible series. Uh, first, just some housekeeping. You've been muted on entry with videos turned off. Uh, we have time carved out for questions. If you have them, please use the ask a question function at the bottom of your page. The lecture is being recorded and will be shared via email in the coming days on the library YouTube page. Before we begin the program, we would like to acknowledge that Wilfrid Laurier University and its campuses are located on the Haldeman Tract, traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We recognize, honor, and respect these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and water on which Laurier is now present. Perhaps you're joining us from another location. If that's the case, I would encourage you to take a moment to honor the Indigenous people who have lived and worked where you reside historically and presently. Acknowledging them reminds us of our important connection to this land where we live, learn, and work. I'm excited to inter introduce tonight's topic, Dene Health and Wellness Research, Decho First Nations in the driver's seat with Dr. Melody Morton Ninomiya and Kristen Tanche. Melody um, has a blend of Japanese and white Mennonite upbringing and heritage, raised in Japan and spent adult life in Southern Ontario and East Coast Newfoundland and Labrador. She is a faculty member in health sciences at Wilfrid Laurier University and an affiliate scientist with the Institute for Mental Health Policy Research at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Her research is mostly community partnered research regarding Indigenous people's health and wellness, critical public health, mental health and addictions, knowledge mobiliza mobilization, and with a specific interest in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Kristen Tanche is part of the Lidli Kwe First Nation in the Decho region of the Northwest Territories. Kristen is an alumni of the Aurora College Social Work Program, the, Ch the De Chinta Program, and the Glasgow Northern Fellowship Program. She, is all, she was also involved with local community positions. She is a former member of the Lilikwe First Nation Band Council, the Fort Simpson District Education Authority, and other local and territorial boards. She currently works for Decho First Nations as their Regional Health and Wellness Coordinator. Thank you both for being here this evening. I'm just going to get your presentation started. Okay, I hope people can see the slides. I don't know, I can't see it. <laughs> Maria, we've, you've disappeared from our view, um, but I don't know if people can see the slides. Sorry, I just a small technical difficulty. I'm bringing them up. Well, while Maria is bringing it up, maybe what I can do is tell you what's on our first slide, which is really um, the title overarching sort of theme of what Kristen and I will be talking about. Um, it's about Dene Health, sorry, Dene Health and Wellness Research, and specifically Decho First Nations in the driver's seat. And we want to highlight four key things um, after we introduce ourselves. So we'll start with um, self-locating each of us in turn, um, and then tell you briefly how we came to work together, um, and then share a bit about the projects that we worked on and end with highlighting what is unique. Um, I think at least from my perspective and Kristen's perspective, unique about our working relationship in the context of doing this research together. So uh, Kristen, if you don't mind, and Maria, if you could go to the next slide, um, please go ahead. Merci to everyone. Um, as I was introduced, uh, my name is Kristen Tanche, but I'm going to introduce myself quickly in my language, which is Dene Jati, my mother's language. Uh, 
Kristen Tanche Suje Sudukoi Gotseate, Samo Kathy Tanche Uje, Seta Gunnar Paulson Uje. I am from Fort Simpson, Sudukoi Northwest Territories. My mother's name is Kathy Tanche and my father's name is Gunnar Paulson. Um, the late Gunnar Paulson. I introduced myself this way because it's how we introduce ourselves in the Northwest Territories. Often we say who our parents are, who our family is, and where we're from because chances are we're related or you have some sort of connection to my family. Um, so my name is Kristen. I work for Daycho First Nations and Regional Health and Wellness. I used to work in lands and resources and um, all sorts of other different positions. I used to work in also on the land programming for Daycho First Nations. Um, for some of you may be familiar with Daycho First Nations, but some of you may not. So Daycho First Nations is a regional indigenous government, government in the Northern Northwest Territories and Southern Northwest Territories. Um, we're comprised of several indigenous organizations and together united we are Daycho First Nations. We were originally established for negotiations purposes. We are still in negotiations for self-governance, um, but since its inception, Daycho First Nations has grown um, and part of that growth is in health and wellness. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so a little bit about my background is my father is non-Indigenous Canadian. He was of Icelandic, like settler Canadian descent. And my mother is Decho Dene, the Khoi First Nation from Fort Simpson, North Territories. Um, as mentioned, I'm an alumni of the Dishinta program. Dishinta is a post-secondary program that amalgamates and does you learn on the land. So essentially you're learning post-secondary education things and get post-secondary education credits while also being immersed on the land. Um, not only am I a person who has taken land-based programming, I've also delivered land-based programming in my former position with Daycho First Nations. And I think that it was during those programs that I really began to see and experience the need for community engagement and research that was really led by Indigenous people and for Indigenous people and with partners. Um, I was also part of the Jane Glasgow Northern Fellowship Program, where I did community-based research of my own in the community I live in, Fort Simpson, where I talked to people in my community about what they thought about addictions programming and asked them about their thoughts on solutions for to improve our addictions programming. Um, so when I started to work for Daycho First Nations, I really began to see the positive impacts um, that community engagement and working with researchers can have through the Daycho County Guardian Stewardship Program. Um, it's an amazing program that was really based on communities in the Daycho region. It was based on um, all sorts of different types of research projects and coming together as a region. Just a really beautiful thing. I encourage you guys to Google it or just go on Daycho First Nations. You'll find out tons of information. But it was really through those experiences and my background um, that really provided me with some really great direction on how to start working in health and wellness. And that kind of is a perfect segue into Melody because that's my experiences, I guess, led me to um, come up with the idea and to start to reach out to people in the research world um, for Daycho First Nations because we needed some research done in health and wellness. And like I mentioned, a lot of my experiences really helped inform the importance of community-based research, working with partners, and all of that jazz. <laughs> so I'll pass it on to you, Melody. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Kristen. And Maria, if you could go to the next slide. Um, so I am a Melody. Morton Nino Mia is my whole last name. Um, that's just a short or small picture of my immediate family. Um, my father's like Tokyo born and raised a uh, Japanese um, person. And my mother is Swiss German Mennonite from Conestoga St. Jacobs in Southern Ontario, um, white settler. I'm married. I have three kids. Two have already moved on and moved out. <laughs> um, and I have one left remaining. So um, 
I think I'll, I'll ask to move on to the next slide to give a little bit more context. Um, and I am recycling a slide uh, that is very like focused on more of my, my vocational trajectory, but I just want to highlight a couple of things. And one of them is um, uh, just to say, I was born in the same place that I am now living and working, um, but grew up in Japan. Um, and so I have, you know, two, two different cultural backgrounds, but heritage as well. So like I grew up part in Japan, part in um, parts of Canada. And I, um, what I would like to highlight here is, yeah, like um, my trajectory that's led me to where I am today and why I do the work that I do today, which sort of then brings, brings it up to speed with um, how I came to meet up with Kristen. Um, I just want to highlight uh, in the slide here that I did not have aspirations of doing research. Like I think my pathway to doing the work that I do now is very nonlinear, but a very pivotal moment I will say was around um, the middle part of that image there where it's based research. After, um, I was trained as a high school math and phys ed teacher. And I went back and did my master's of education with the intent of probably going back to teaching, but I didn't go back to high school teaching. But in doing um, community-based research, um, working with pregnant and parenting teens, children and emergency foster care, people who had housing insecurity and women who were preparing for being released from prison and reintegrating into community, all led me to being very interested uh, in, and becoming a foster parent, um, becoming interested in the topic of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And that put me on a path that led to doing a PhD and, um, and ended up doing some work both in St. John's, but also with uh, a cl working closely with the First Nation. Um, and it was through that work and those relationships that um, solidified my strong interest in continuing to do community partnered or community driven research. Um, and so upon finishing my, my PhD work, um, ended up working at St. Mike's in Toronto and then CAMH where I'm still affiliated and now very happily situated at Laurier. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? So just briefly to say how Kristen and I even came to meet, I would like to make a little shout out to uh, Dr. Alex Latta, who I think might be <laughs> on this call. Um, he's a faculty member here at Laurie that Kristen has worked with and has a longer standing relationship with. And I think, um, I don't know the precise nature of how it, it came up, but I know Kristen, I think you had had a conversation with uh, Alex Lada about someone who might be a good fit for doing some kind of research work with you because you had a vision for some things that you really wanted to pursue. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to hand over to you now. Yeah, yeah, it was through Alex Lada. Um, and so Dato First Nations, as I mentioned, has branched out into health and wellness and into the area. And it's a new, new position when I started back in 2020 and new division essentially for the organization. And so at the onset in the position, we knew and within health and wellness that we needed to come up with a good foundation. And so we decided, well, we're gonna try to create a vision of health and wellness and try to create some guiding statements that's really informed by our communities and um, having leadership engaged. And we knew a big piece was gonna be research because there's been a lot of work done in the area of health and wellness in our region. We have a lot of community members who have talked about health and wellness, and there's a lot of work currently happening in health and wellness. And um, so that's when I had worked with Alex Latta and said, well, who, who do you know anyone in the research world that would possibly be a good fit for this type of project? And um, that's when me and Melody started to work together. And um, another key piece of our health and wellness vision and kind of the planning that was going on behind it was we wanted to have a regional health gathering too that would further, um, we could further gather more information from our community members, we could create, create networking opportunities, but also to share some of the research findings that uh, we had come up with. Um, if you can move on to the next slide, please. 
Oh, and by the way, I live by an uh, airport, and so an airplane just took off. If anybody hears like some planes and stuff, it's because there's planes literally. I can see them out of my window. So as I was saying, a huge part of um, our overall vision and overall way of how we we're going to come together with these guiding statements was through community and date show organizations engagement. Um, we were really with the intent to have each of our communities in the region, which are eight or um, eight communities and 10 organizations that are part of date show First Nations, but there's a few more that are in the region. Um, so the intent was really to have them involved in leading the direction of visioning work and all of those guiding statements, because it's really vital for us that communities are involved in the process. We really wanted to ensure that it was a bottom up approach as opposed to the bottom down approach. I think in the history of colonization and still is ongoing in many communities, not just indigenous, um, but there is often very top heavy, the higher levels telling the, I guess, other levels what they need and how that how it's going to be done. And when we're working in health and wellness, we wanted to make sure that it was the other way. As part of that work, we decided we were going to form a working group comprised of community members and people who work in health and wellness. And this working group was going to help further lead a lot of this work that we were going to do. Um, and as I mentioned, we had a regional health gathering. So if you can move to the next slide, please. So um, maybe I'll let you start off this slide, Melody, and then you can pass it off to me. No. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so this, is, this slide is really intended to just give a brief overview of the three projects and who was involved and to, you know, what, what came out of it. But I think our intent following this slide, though, is to um, maybe give you more of a window into each of the three components. Mm -hmm. So in short, um, Kristen had articulated some of the things that she really saw as important components and we broke it down into three research questions. So they ended up being three distinct, though complementary research projects, if being called like mini projects. And um, in designing those projects, Kristen and I had a number of conversations, but um, there were also other people involved. So we just wanted to highlight that it's the two of us are sharing today, but there were other people involved, including a couple of research assistant uh, folks, some were like recent graduates um, from a grad program to students who are currently enrolled. Um, there was also someone that Kristen had working with her in, within Dejo First Nations as a research assistant. And there was also um, someone helping out as an advisor. So we had like a bit of a, a team working on these various different projects. The three research questions that we focused on were, what health and wellness services currently exist to members of Dejo First Nations broadly? The second is, what has the region said about health and wellness? So like looking back, this is not a new topic, like people have spoken and shared about this plenty, but rather than go and interview or gather more new information, rather than have to sort of interrupt life and create more of an imposition on people when this work has happened in different places, is like pulling together all of that information to see what has been said in the past. And then the third is looking outside, not necessarily within Dejo First Nations, but like what has worked in other um, indigenous communities where there was evidence of self-governance and self-determination around how health systems and services were provided. So that's more of, yeah, like a literature-based research question. And um, yeah, through our conversations, I think Kristen and a few others would have chimed in too in terms of what would be the most helpful way to present or pull all of the findings from these three studies um, I think up to the present, we've had um, reports that are quite detailed and include all of the details that you'd want to hold on to or refer to, but also some plain language summary documents that are really easy to share in a meeting or share at a gathering that just gives high level um, main points. And then um, 
also some posters. So like we're going to, I think Kristen is going to show you the poster shortly around the asset maps, which was answering question number one, what are current services that exist? And then I can't speak to how it was shared at the health forum, but also like engaging with people in person, um, the findings um, at a health forum. So Kristen, do you feel free to add anything at this point. Yeah, I think um, the sharing and using findings when we were speaking about how we were going to share it and who is it for, the audience is really broad. So right now, all three documents um, we're going to be sending to a designer so they have really a cohesive look. But the thought about like the summer, the sharing and the using of the findings and all these things was we're going to be sharing it with people, just everyday community members who may know not very much about health and wellness or who may know a lot. We were going to share it with um, leaders, political leaders. We were going to share the information with programmers. So a wide range of people was um, what the intent of the documents is from. Is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So are you okay to go to the next slide? And what we'll be doing is in turn now, we're going to be sharing snippets or highlights of uh, what came out of those three, answering those three research questions. Mm -hmm. So um, what you guys see is Daycho Health and Wellness Services and Programs. This is part of our asset map, the first answer to the question of what are what's currently going on in health and wellness in the region. Um, at the onset of the like discussions, we talked about how we want to like paint a picture of health services and do a scan of all the different services that we could find in the Daycho region and that people were using. And what a challenge that was. Um, because health isn't just four things like you see on here. You see family wellness, mental wellness, uh, physical wellness, culture land. But you also see on the left hand, we have a bunch more categories because health is not just um, health. It's justice. It's education. It's all these other things. And so as we started scanning, more and more things kept adding to the, to the scan and more and more things kept adding to the document but it's all related. Um, so what you guys see is the first version of our poster. It's going to be actually going through another editing phase. And you'll see that the imagery um, is drawn by our own one of our own members, Mila Naheko, she sketched out these beautiful graphics. We decided if we were going to answer this research question, we wanted to make sure that the information that we were compiling was useful, not only for planning, but we wanted to have it as a tool for our community members. Often navigating the health and wellness system and just the health field in particular is very challenging. Um, and so why not create a sort of directory? And so people could not only see what there is available, but they could use it as an everyday tool. And we wanted to make sure that it was um, indigenous friendly. So it was images that our people could relate to. In our area, we hunt moose, golo. And so an elder or a youth or just anybody in this region, honestly, and in the Northwest Territories is gonna see a picture of a moose and they're gonna know that that's something from their homeland you see an image of a cranberry and that is something we harvest every fall in the Northwest Territories, many of our people and in this region. And so we wanted to make sure that the things were identifiable to the people that were using it. There is directories and whatnot that the government of the Northwest Territories puts out, but it's not necessarily Daycho specific and it's not done by Daycho First Nations or our own people with our own people drawing the imagery and really involved in the process. And so eventually this will all go online. We'll have posters like this one. We'll have brochures. We'll have like a printed directory um, that we'll share with our organizations and share with online and with people who might want them. So that was our first research um, question answered. <laughs> well, Kristen, did you, uh, maybe <laughs> putting on the spot, but I know there is also talk about having more of like a water theme or a sort of motif. Yeah. I didn't know if you yeah. wanted to. Sure. So everything was really, really intentional. Um, and we're, so you'll see that in the 
the poster, there's a lot of blues and it looks like water. Well, our region is located along the Decho River, the Mackenzie River, but we're all connected to that water system, whether you're in Semba K, um, which is one of our member organizations and communities, they are located on a lake called Semba K and their water system feeds into the Decho. All of our other communities are somehow, we're all connected by this river system that's either feeding into it or directly on it. And so water is a very important part of our region and we're all tied to it. And so we wanted to make sure too that um, that there's this theme of water. And so you can really feel that when you look at the poster. Mm -hmm. So Maria, I think you can go to the next slide, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the second document that we worked on was what the Daecho region has said about health and wellness. So as Melody and I was saying, um, there's been a lot of conversation around health and wellness. And when we started talking, started talking with Melody, I was like, well, we have a bunch of documents at Daecho First Nations. We have meeting summaries. We have like research that has been done, some parts of research that Alex Latta, other people at Wilfrid Laurier has worked with Daecho First Nations to work on, where people have talked about um, health and wellness. And there's other like gray literature and um, community wellness plans, all sorts of information out there. And so what we decided to do is that we were going to look at um, a bunch of those documents and we we're going to pull out quotes and things that related to health and wellness and put it all into a huge spreadsheet. Thank goodness for Wilfrid Laurier and <laughs> your guys' expertise and your students' expertise on how to do like amazing spreadsheets because that was super helpful and useful in this entire <laughs> process and organizing all the different data that um, our researcher researcher was pulling from the document she was reading. Uh, so she, we had someone internally at Day Chill First Nations, um, one of our members, uh, Ramona Pearson, um, was hired to do some research with us and she reviewed hundreds of documents internally. Um, one of the quotes on here is one of the quotes that she had pulled that health and wellness are inseparable from Decho Dene culture, Dene Jati, Dene knowledge, and Dene laws and values and principles. We can go on to the next slide. Um, so some of the things that they're research found and the report found was that in our region, we say that everything is rooted in Dene Atite. Uh, Dene Atite is like a way of being, like a Dene way of being. It encompasses like all sorts of things like language and Dene laws and values and principles. It's a very holistic like way of thinking and being. Um, they, we also found that health and wellness in our region centers around concepts center around Dene laws and values, Dene ways of being and traditional healing and medicine. A lot of these things, if you're not familiar with them, you can go on the Dato First Nations website. We did a series of videos that talk about Dene laws and values and really highlight um, our different cultural practices and could really give you a real glimpse into what, what this all means. Um, what we also found was that community specific priorities are really key and that bridging traditional and modern lifestyles is very necessary. Do you have anything to add to no. that <laughs> research piece now? Okay. No. Awesome. We can I think go we can... Yeah, next one. So by now, there was the asset map, which was like what services are available to people of Daicho First Nations. And then Kristen just went through like, what have people said? And this next portion is answering the third question. Like, what do we know about other indigenous led health services and systems? And this was done through what's called a rapid review. So it's where you do like a, like a very planned, intentional, but not comprehensive in a way that takes years to accomplish, so of literature that exists. And so what we did was we looked at literature that uh, was focused on mostly rural um, indigenous communities across Canada, the US, Australia, and New Zealand. And we looked at the last approximate 10 years. I think we looked from 2010 to 2020, which is when we had started doing this work. 
and uh, looking for themes uh, that could be relevant and helpful um, for Kristen's own planning as she engages with you know people across all of the different communities and that are part of Dejo First Nations. So just to briefly highlight, there were six key themes that came out of the literature, and I'll just briefly speak to each of them. So the access to primary care is really referring to the there was better health outcomes when communities had access to primary care right in the community or very close to. Alternatively, when there isn't, people have to typically access like ambulatory, like ambulances or emergency services because they don't have access to a local clinic or hospital that pro provides primary care. The second one was around having really solid, good relationship-based knowledge exchange sort of mechanisms where there was open communication of medical and health related knowledge between patients and care providers. And so this is also tied to the third point around culturally, you know, safe care, culturally appropriate care, but just having good communication. So some of the articles would have talked about um, when communicating, depending on language differences, using you know, visual aids, translators, uh, motivational interviewing, etc. And culturally appropriate care um, shouldn't be surprising. It's really about making sure that there are Indigenous staff, um, where there were uh, more Indigenous local Indigenous healers, practitioners, elders, or knowledge keepers involved in some way within the, the health support system, um, there tended to be much better outcomes. And then the fourth piece was around training and building community capacity. So that's really about you know, increasing the number of trained and employed local staff, um, which I know uh, takes some planning and takes a number of years to build up. But in places where communities were able to um, increase the number of local staff, um, there was definitely improved um, experiences and more cultural safety. Um, and for those who are non-Indigenous or non-local to a community that they have um, training and learning and education about the local uh, nation or communities, understanding the local history, the culture and the language. And number five, integrated care was around just like having different um, care systems, providers and services and programs working together and not working in silos. And so it could, in some papers, they were talking about bridging sort of the biomedical Western systems with local ways of healing and, and um, you know, encouraging good health. But it also like in the Canadian context on reserve, for example, there are quite a few different jurisdictions involved in providing care and just making sure that they're all talking and communicating with each other uh, to deliver a cohesive um, set of services and care for people. And the last one is like making sure there's funding to actually do all of the things, numbers one through five. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we can go to the next slide, please. Awesome. Um, thanks, Melody. So these three research documents have actually proven to be quite useful. Uh, just uh, last week, actually, we were having a small working group meeting. We're doing some health and wellness planning around programming. And I was able to go to these documents and quickly pull out some of those best practices, those six key themes that Melody just talked about. And I was able to look back at what the Decho has said and pull out some information from there to kind of help lead us in our health and wellness programming. I was able to say this is what communities have said is important um, via their community wellness plans. It's all right here. And so already um, it's proven to be quite quite useful in our planning practices. And um, I've been able to use the information and I've, I've presented it a few times to our community members. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to the day that we'll have it like finally designed and put on the Dejo First Nations website because it's such 
amazing information, I think, that really comes from the Daicho people, was really driven by Daicho First Nations, but really was a lot of work between um, Wolford Laurier, Melody, and team. And it was a real joint project, I feel. And I felt that through the process, um, Melody and the team were very respectful about Daicho First Nations wishes, how we wanted to see things, trying to like help make this vision come through. And so it was a very fruitful relationship. <laughs> um, this entire this entire work that we've been doing in health and wellness at Daicho First Nations is extremely evolving and it's a community driven work. And I always say that things always change. Um, I didn't know at the beginning what was gonna come out at the end. <laughs> it was always evolving. We changed like gears sometimes with our, um, with the research and the direction or we'd quickly do brainstorming sessions and so it was an evolving project from the beginning um just how i look at community driven health and wellness and community-based research and community-based anything really i think it's always evolving and should always involve community members i felt that this research did that because we involved um other Daicho First Nations people. We had Kathy Tetso, an advisor. We had Ramona Pearson doing some on the ground research. And I've actually had some other Daicho First Nations people review the document and provide some feedback. Um, so I thought it was extremely community driven. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Kristen. I see. Hmm. <laughs> um, if you could go to the next slide, please. I, and while you're transitioning uh, to say I've, yeah, me personally, I've really enjoyed working on this project with Kristen and others. And I feel like it was a real merging of like our collective quote unquote teams or our colleagues or people that we work with and trying to pull on whatever resources we could to make it happen. And um, we put together the slide to highlight like something, just to highlight a couple of things that I, I think are, are somewhat unique in terms of how research might commonly be done. Um, and I, yeah, I feel like the nature of our relationship and the scope of work and the timing and the way we did it um, is somewhat different from a lot of the other projects that I've been part of. Um, so I won't speak for Kristen, but uh, I wanted to highlight a couple of things here. The first one is um, it was unique in that a lot of times research projects need to like find project funding or grant funding or research funding to support it. But in this case, we kind of pooled our like our current and existing resources that we had available, some of which was human resources and time and were able to pull it together with what we both had. Um, you'll correct me if I'm if I'm misspeaking, right, Kristen? I think. Yeah, you're, you're on par, right on. Okay. <laughs> um, and so we were able to just make it work. And, and I think those are things we had considered also when we were thinking about the scope of work that we would do. And um, so for example, like ways in which we pooled our resources is Kristen had access to, um, I don't know how it worked, but you, you were able to hire Ramona um, Pearson to work on this project. I already was working with Nicole Burns who was quite involved in a number of different aspects of of those projects and i had hired a summer student emily wassman storf who was working on other projects but we just had her dedicate some of her work time to working on the asset map so we were able to pool people that we were able to hire already had hired to work uh very part-time and and share their time this way and then i know kathy tetso also helped out quite a bit um, and then I had one undergrad student who, you know, chose to do an undergrad thesis project and um, in speaking with Kristen was comfortable with her doing a lot of the, the I'll call it grunt work, but like the, the labor of doing the search. And so we involved like our Laurier librarian and um, Brianna worked very closely with Kathy in particular and myself and Kristen to make sure it was being done well. and. Um, yeah, so we're able to pool sort of that kind of resources. So it's kind of a win-win-win for for Kristen, myself, students, and and others. Um, and we were able to accomplish the project in a relatively short time for a number of reasons. One, we didn't have to apply for funding and then wait to hear back. We could just get started. 
there wasn't like data collection from speaking to humans or, or like there was no human research component. We were working with existing documents or things that we had at our fingertips that were available. Um, and so we were able to do it in a relatively short time. And because of the nature of the project, it's completely owned, guided and driven by DHO First Nations. Like Kristen initiated the scope of work. We talked it through, I feel like, the parts that I contribute is ideas around structuring some of the research but in terms of content and some of the process and what was available and then analyzing some of the work that that definitely came from not just Kristen but Kathy and a few others within DHO First Nations. And then to highlight a couple of added benefits is that um, students and um, like I'm thinking Ramona Pearson for example and Nicole Burns and anyways, all, all the people involved, it was an opportunity to get some additional training in some specific research skills, but also learn more about um, Deitcho First Nations. And um, yeah, I think I already said it, but I, I just put here so I wouldn't forget that. Yeah, Laurier students had an opportunity to do some training and reviews, but also be mentored by a collective um, in their research school research skills, as well as understanding better understanding and learning about important research principles of working with indigenous nations and communities, but specifically with Dejo First Nations. Yeah, so I wanted to, yeah, also I think you mentioned Mila. Um, you pronounce it Naheko, right? I think so. Honestly, I'm probably pronouncing her last name wrong also. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like I feel like our collective team, like Kristen and I are representing work that she contributed a lot to in terms of the artwork. Ramona Pearson put in a lot of time, uh, particularly in going through all those documents for what the Deitra have said. Um, and then I know Kathy put in a lot of time on the on the rapid review and then Emily uh, helped out with the directory and Brianna, the undergrad student who's since moved on um, to other to, to graduate school um, with the rapid review and then Nicole Burns was extremely instrumental in, in helping organize and write up some of the reports around what the DHO have said. So yeah, I thank you to all of those folks. Kristen, what else would you add? I think we're near the end, but I don't want to ask to move to the next slide unless you, you're ready. Um, I think I would add that an added benefit is that historically, between researchers and the research world, the relationship with Indigenous communities isn't always the best. We all should probably know about the helicopter approach and that type of like work. And I think that um, working in a good way with, with your team, Melody, um, to me, it really embodied the concept of walking into worlds is the term that we use that the Plicho use up here in the Northwest Territories is um, the two ways of being and knowing that's also called like the two eyed seeing, but having indigenous uh, ways of being and doing things combined with the Western way of doing and being and doing things so like the Western education system and the research world and those things. And so to me, I found that um, this project was a really great example of how those two things can come together and benefit everybody in the end. Um, we've have, we have a lot of benefits. We have a lot of information that's gonna be really useful in our planning purposes that uh, we all were able to participate in. And so I thought that that was a benefit too, is helping um, create good relationships when mm -hmm. historically there hasn't always been so. Thank yeah. you, Kristen. That's super important. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so we just have one more slide, but it's kind of a, a thank you and then opening it up for um, questions or comments from those who are joining online. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and join you. Okay. I'm on my way. <laughs> There's like a delay. So even when I was changing your slides, I'm like, why is it? Why is there a delay? <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoyed um, listening to your presentation about your research. If anyone has a question, um, please use the ask a question tab or, or you can pop it into this 
little chat tab right here. I'll just put a little smiley face in there. Um, I, I, the thing that came to me, um, so with this research, it, it, are you kind of at the starting point of using it or are you already seeing outcomes or, or um, um, you know, how you were mentioning um, community driven made me think of um, at the library, we, we, we use community led. So it, it's such an Im important model to really, you need to go to the community to see what, what their needs are. Um, so are you um, implementing some of these, um, some of this research already in your community or has it been kind of evolving since the start? A bit of both. So um, because I haven't gotten it to the designer, like I really want it to, to be very cohesive looking and all those sorts of things before we put it out in the general public. But I've given it to multiple community members via like our health forum. And like I said, we've been accessing the information just last week. I was using it to um, help provide supplementary information as we were doing some planning and health and wellness work. And so it's already being accessed and already being like, I guess, used on the ground, um, so to say. And then I have hopes that it'll be even more access. Like I'm really excited for the asset map to come out um, for the, the beautiful poster with the images and stuff like that. Cause I think that already I'm getting feedback from people who have seen it that, oh, can I have a copy? Like that would be such a useful tool for us to use and um, all of those things. So, yeah. Right. Bit of both. <laughs> well, it's advantageous, I think, because Kristen is in a really like in her position has an opportunity to really widely share it because you're engaged with all of the community health mm -hmm. leads, right? Yeah, yeah. And um yeah. The actually, actually, the research, just to quickly add on top of that, is Daycho First Nations and I think a lot of other nations are um, even more involved in health and wellness. In the Northwest Territories, there's a big push for on the land programming and health and wellness programs um, to help with a lot of different social issues that have more of a focus on indigenous culture and way of being. And so it's really quite timely that this research I didn't know this, what was coming was coming, I guess, in terms of health and wellness programming and on the land programming. But this research, I think, will have um, be very useful as we do different, different things in the planning processes. Excellent. Thus far, a uh, lovely comment here from Alex Lada, which you um, mentioned in your presentation here, if you like to, to read it. Um, yeah, he was our matchmaker. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So is the research meant to be uh, specifically used by the communities, uh, the Dish of First Nations, or are, are you seeking it to be used in a broader way for like um, people outside the communities to understand um, how health and wellness is approached in Dish of First Nations? Yeah, really just for us, but what a great way to like, yeah, <laughs> be a great it. also to help. More research for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, really just the intent was for us to use it for our own like purposes and for mm -hmm. our own people, but it would be extremely helpful to help explain to outside people um, what the Day Chill region has said about health and wellness or what our services are like. Um, yeah. Well, the so. rapid review might be one exception because it wasn't focused on the day show. And so yeah. that one, like Kristen, Kathy, myself, and Brianna um, wrote a paper that we've, it's under review now and we're hoping it would get published in a very Indigenous health specific um, issue of a journal. Um, and that would be for others to potentially benefit from it once it's published. Mm -hmm. yeah. True. Excellent. Yes, in the thank you email for anyone who um, is registered for our Laurier Milton Lecture Series email, um, I'll definitely ask you for some um, references, not references, research that you'd like to, to share with um, the attendees here today. 
Um, we've got a, everyone's shy. No one wants to ask anything further. You explained everything so well. Um, mm -hmm. That's really the the end of my questions. So um, if no one else is 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 going to jump forward, um, I would just like to say thank you so much on behalf of Wilfrid Laurier University and the Milton Public Library. Thank you, Melody and Kristen, for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us this evening. Thank you also to all of the attendees for joining us for the final lecture of the season. A copy of tonight's lecture will be shared on the Milton Public Library website in the next few days, and as well as on the YouTube page. Uh, and we will, like I mentioned, be sharing links and information. Um, I see a question just popped up, but I'm gonna finish. <laughs> we'll be sharing links and information uh, for those who are registered for the Laurier Lecture Series newsletter. And if you're not, go to the library website, beinspired.ca to register. Um, and we are in already in the planning stages for the next series. So um, I would say keep it, keep your eye out for late summer for, for any updates. But Shauna has asked us a question um, about uh, what are the next steps? Is there anything you would do differently on the next project you do together? Hmm. Next steps, meaning like for Dato First Nations, I'm assuming is what the question means, um, and health and wellness. So our next steps in Dato, at Dato First Nations is we've, um, we've had through other community processes, we've formed some guiding statements, which this research actually has kind of helped inform in a way. Um, and some vision member at the beginning of the presentation, we talked about how we want to come up with a vision, a foundation for health and wellness for Dato First Nations and for our region. That's our next steps is one day we're going to be a self-governing nation. We're in negotiations for it. We have been for a long time and we want to set some good foundational work that the region can look to um, once that time comes, but also we've been more active in regional health and wellness types of programs. And so our next steps are really to build our health and wellness department. Um, it's a stated need from our leaders and membership that they want to see health and wellness programs and um, our health and wellness working groups that they want to see this all of this work expanded. So there's a lot of other next steps. Um, in terms of research, I think that there's always going to be some sort of need for research from Dato First Nations, and so there's potential to continue our relationship with Melody and Wilfrid Laurier. Um, who knows what we're going to want to research or need research next? I don't know, <laughs> but I'm sure that there's going to be something coming. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know who you are, Shauna, but I was also going to say, like, whenever I, I work with anybody on a project, I don't see our relationship as being limited to the time of the project. So I feel like Kristen and I will stay in touch. But I mean, I think researchers really should only go when they're invited. So like, I, I would only probably work with Kristen if, if she felt like it would be a helpful, like a useful partnership to do, but that our relationship would continue to uh, to flourish it, even if we, whether or not we're working on a project together. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I would do anything too much more differently for the, like our, our next project. I thought the process that me and Melody used, which wasn't like, we're gonna come here and do this and this and this was kind of almost more organic. Um, I think we worked really well together. And so I don't really think I would change a whole lot about how we worked together or what we did. Um, the one thing I might change on my end is it takes a lot of time. And as a person who works for an Indigenous organization with many different layers and lots of things going on, it's devoting the time to be able to read the documents thoroughly and really making the time and have, making sure um, you have the time to work on the research pieces. Mm -hmm. um, so Nathan, uh, has mentioned here that he is a radiation biologist. Uh, do you have any community insights about what the Indigenous communities think about proposed plans of storing nuclear waste on Indigenous lands? Hmm. No, I don't have any community insights because we don't, so we don't necessarily have nuclear waste in our region. So I don't think our communities would have a whole lot of thought, but our community members and most indigenous groups are 
the land is our life. We're so tied to the land. Our culture is tied to the land. Our cultures like are often focused on a huge part of our culture anyways, is focused on like moose. We get our meat from the moose. We get um, materials from the moose and our, it's just so tied to the land. And so any sort of wastage or um, things that would change the land is I think a huge concern to most indigenous people, because we're a culture that is so tied and syncretically tied to the land that um, I would assume that most people would think that storing nuclear waste is not a good idea um, and would really consider the environment and anything that was done on the land. It's a heavy question to end on. <laughs> um, Anyone else? Any last minute? <laughs> oh, he said sorry. Good question. Good question. <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, <laughs> okay, no, no stragglers. Well, thank you again, Kristen and uh, Melody. It's been a pleasure having you close out the 2021-2022 Laurie Milton Lecture Series. Thank you everyone who attended and uh, hope to see you again sometime. And I look forward to reading about your research. Thank awesome. you. Take care, everyone. I see, ciao, everyone. I see. Mm -hmm.